But without further ado, um, we will have Dr. Shry presenting on all of this amazing imaging. So um, take it, Dr. Shry. All right. Uh, can you see my slides? Did I share the correct screen? It looks like a normal presentation, yeah? Yes, it does. Okay. Looks great. Cool. All right, so I'm Dan Shry. I'm one of the epilepsy specialists at Children's Hospital of Orange County. I'm also the director of neuroscience research there. Um, and I do research in pediatric epilepsy with in mostly infantile spasms, uh, lennox gastaut syndrome, and our kids that go on to have epilepsy surgery. Um, I work from a research standpoint with my wife, uh, Beth Lepor, who is a uh, professor of engineering at UC Irvine, and we do um, epilepsy research together. Uh, Jana Moore refers to us as the Orange County Research Power Couple, which, which cracks me up. Um, and we just really want to try to, you know, do what we can to improve the care of our kids in our, in our um, area of the country that, and nationally that have epilepsy. So um, I am going to talk today about neuroimaging, and this is how we take pictures of the brain. Um, there's a lot of different stuff to go over. I tried to keep my slides down so we could just chat about stuff because a lot of times there's a lot of misconception about what the imaging entails. So I'm going to go over some basics of it, and, um, and we can get as deep into the weeds as you all like. Um, I have a background in engineering, so I can tell you how all these machines work if you really want to know that, but more importantly, uh, how we use them to help improve the care of our kids who have seizures and epilepsy. Okay, so um, I have nothing to disclose relevant to this talk. I do not own stock in an MRI company or anything like that. So uh, a few goals just hit the beginning here. I want to make sure everybody understands the basics of the different types of ways we image the brain for children with seizures and epilepsy. I want to know. What, I want people to know when it's appropriate to have this type of imaging done, and possibly even repeated. Um, and also, how we, as your epilepsy specialist, will use the imaging to guide the care of your child. And also, um, understand why it's important to um, have the testing done at a center that has appropriate expertise. And it kind of follows the mantra of garbage in, garbage out. You know, where um, you can do the best MRI scan in the world, but if the person who's looking at it uh, is not familiar with looking at children who have the MRI scans for epilepsy. Uh, you, things may be missed and definitely happened before. So um, it's a brief overview of brain imaging and why we care, right? So epilepsy is a brain condition, meaning it, it's, it, it originates, seizures originate in the brain, okay? The brain is part of the nervous system. Uh, we think it's the most important part, but we may be a little bit biased. Um, in this picture to the right here, can you, can you see my mouse okay there, Rachel? Good, okay. So this colorful area here is the cerebrum, okay? Cerebral cortex is the covering of this area, this purple thing here. So we think that seizures, and what we know that seizures originate, um, a lot of elect electrical activity we see with seizures will originate from this cortex, right? Now, there are certain types of seizures that are driven by different parts of the brain, not necessarily this covering of the brain called the cortex, or the outermost layer of the brain, excuse me, called the cortex. But we know that at some point seizures engage this when they happen. And so what, why is that important? Well, because when we take beautiful pictures of your brain, we want to make sure we get good pictures of the cortex because a lot of the time that's where the problems are. Not always, but a lot of the time, okay? Um, what's important to know about this cortex? Well, it gets blood uh, from the arteries uh, that pump blood into the brain, um, and blood is drained from it by veins that leave uh, and go back down into the larger vessels of the body. Um, it also is made up of a lot of brain cells, and those brain cells use a lot of energy when they do uh, what they do. So if, you're, if you like the um, computer analogy of the nervous system, the cortex is like the CPU, the central processing unit. It's where all the connections uh, uh, end up and it's where you know uh, the different regions and functions of our brain exist. So when you wiggle your finger, it's a very complex process in your nervous system, but it involves at some point your motor cortex, which tells your finger ultimately to wiggle. So um, without your cortex being functional, um, you are going to have trouble doing just about anything involving higher function, like talking, listening, and understanding, ex understanding what you ex uh, or, uh, um, interpreting what you see, interpreting what you hear, interpreting what you smell, feel. All these things happen in the cortex. Things like breathing do not really happen in the cortex. They happen deeper in the brain, the brain stem, the medulla, 
and um, and another sort of coordination and whatnot happens more back here in the cerebellum. So, um, but all those eloquent functions that we have that set us apart as special creatures um, live in the cortex. And as you see that, when a seizure spreads to a part of the cortex that does something special, like this pink area here, which is this kind of red area, which is like the motor strip where your hand, leg, face, other things, uh, where that function resides, as a seizure spreads to that area, that area starts malfunctioning and you start seeing the usual function of that area, like hand twitching or tongue movements or other things, uh, start to act up, right? So if you have a seizure that spreads to the motor cortex that affects the hand, you may see twitching movements in the hand that are involuntary, right? If there wasn't a seizure in that area, you'd use that area of the brain to move your hand. So it's just kind of a dysfunctional representation of um, what the normal function would be, okay? Um, so we can look at these structures of the brain, the blood supply to the brain, the metabolism, meaning like how the brain uses energy to do its thing, and electrical activity of the brain using a lot of different modalities. Our main way we look at electrical activity is EEG, which you may have heard about in another talk, but um, I'm not really talking too much about that today, but we use that a lot in epilepsy. And then we look at other things like the structure and whatnot too. So I'm gonna go through these four different modalities of imaging the brain, starting with CT, our CAT scans. Um, we used to call them CAT scans, C-A-T, which stood for computed axial tomography. Now we just call them CT, but we still shorten it to CAT scans. So commuted tomo com computed tomography, okay? This is one of the scans we use. It uses x-rays, okay? And uh, the machine looks like a donut, but it's not the only donut-shaped machine we use but it is the one with the biggest hole in the donut and that you can easily move in and out of and it is very fast, okay? So just remember that. Um, if you're claustrophobic, chances are you're gonna be just fine in a CT scanner because it's very big and open as opposed to an MRI, which is like a tiny tube that they stick you in. Um, different centers, this is kind of an important thing I wanted to hit here. Um, different centers use different protocols when they actually perform their CT scans. So. One of the things that we do at, at, at Children's Orange County that a lot of pediatric hospitals do is we have specific scans that limit the amount of x-rays we use because um, we know that x-rays are not great. They're great to take pictures with, but they're not great for your DNA and other cells in your body, right? So we wanna limit those x-rays as much as we can while still getting a good enough picture. And we know that kids don't need as many x-rays as adults do because kids' skulls are not quite as thick or um, calcium rich as adults are. So the x-ray is penetrated a lot easier and you don't need as much radiation as you would an adult. So we should wanna spare these kids as much as possible. So we have specific protocols based on how old the kid is to spare them as much, much of the x-ray radiation as possible, okay? Onward, so how does an x-ray work? You probably know some of this before, but x-rays are special radioactive molecules that are made by a machine and that are basically directed towards a part of the body. They get bounced off or absorbed by certain types of tissue and they pass through other types of tissue. So they pass through th things like skin and, and mo most fatty substances and blood and whatnot, but they either bounce off or get absorbed by, by denser structures like bones um, and metal. They bounce off metal um, and so what you're left with is you have something, so you have a, an x-ray machine which shoots x-rays towards a part of your body. Some of them pass through, some of them don't. And then there's a film on the other side that whenever the x-rays hit the film, it, it, there's a detectors in that film, okay? And we live in the digital age. So instead of an actual film that gets exposed like with a camera, we actually have little digital detectors. And every time a little x-ray hits a detector, it makes a little check mark basically in the computer. and after a certain number of x-rays pass through, they can create a picture of what your bones and other dense materials of your body look like, okay? So that's, a, that's just a basic x-ray machine. A CT scan is where they take that x-ray machine and they mount it on a big circular, what we call a gantry, which is kind of like a hula hoop, right? And so they got the x-ray generator on one side they have the x-ray detectors on the other side, and then they slowly spin the hula hoop around and they take pictures of a two-dimensional part of your body. So in this case, this little dark area here shows a part of this person's body that's being imaged 
by this x-ray tube and detectors as it spins around. Um, and then after it goes around, there's a computer that records exactly what x-rays go through and what don't. And after it kind of circles the entire slice there, it can create a picture based on what it sees. Now, this is how the first x-ray looked. There was one uh, x-ray tube. There was a series of detectors on the other side. And I had to go all the way around 360 degrees to take one picture of one slice. And then it would move just a little bit up. And then it would do the whole thing over again and get another slice. And then it would move a little bit up. So you can imagine that takes a lot of time. You may be asking yourself, how come nowadays it takes about 40 seconds to do this? How could it possibly do that? It's because the current scanners don't just have a single x-ray tube and a single set of detectors. They have upwards of 128 of these x-ray tubes and similarly, a whole ton of detectors on the other side. So they actually, instead of going all the way around, they only have to move a very small difference because these detectors are all the way around, right? So if you have 128 detectors, Instead of moving 300, let's make it simple. Instead of, let's say you had 120 detectors. Instead of moving 360 degrees, you would only have to rotate the gantry three degrees to actually image the entire slice, all right? So you could imagine that's 120 times faster than going all the way around. So basically they do what's called spiral CT where the gantry, as it rotates, will slowly scan up through the body and then after you know a very short amount of time, it will have collected enough information from the 128 scanners that it can reconstruct all these images of the area that you want to look at. Okay, so um, what do we get when we look at the brain with the CT? Well, we're really good at looking at imaging uh, bone minerals like calcium, for instance, and blood really show up well on a CT. You can see here. This is bone, this is your skull. These are some calcified areas inside your ventricles. This is a normal thing you can see sometimes. Here's probably maybe your pineal gland or something, something else a little calcified. And then uh, blood, if there's a bleed and blood's where it's not supposed to be, then we can see it pretty brightly. And this is a, this is a scan done without IV contrast. So they don't inject what we call contrast into your vein for a scan like this. When you inject contrast, which is typically some form of iodine, and then you shoot an x-ray, then your blood vessels show up really bright like these areas here. Okay, and we'll take a look at that later. So it's okay. It's great for looking at bone bleeding, uh, calcification. It's not great for looking at brain tissue, except that it can help you see things like larger malformations or uh, bigger strokes and other things like that. It doesn't really tell you anything about the function or the activity of the brain tissue um, itself. So let's look at some examples here. So here is a CT scan of the brain. Um, you can see there's a little bit of a difference if you compare the right and the left. You see there's this kind of dark area here that you don't see on the other side. So this would be an example of schizencephaly, which is where there's an area of the brain that didn't form correctly and there's kind of this open kind of schiz or, or a uh, kind of a split that goes all the way down here to the ventricle. So this is one of the, when I was talking about larger malformations that you may be able to see on CT scans. This is an example of one. Here's an example in the middle of a hemorrhage or blood that's been um, that's come out of one of the blood vessels of the brain and gone into the ventricles. And you can see how bright this shows up. It's almost as bright as the skull itself. So you can see there's this bleed here. And if you were to image this now and image it now or later, you could see is it getting bigger? Is it getting smaller? What's it doing? Okay. Here's an example of giving an IV contrast agent when you take a CT scan. So see all these really kind of, they're kind of gray vessels here. These are all blood vessels. And here we call this the arrow sign, multiple arrow sign, right? In radiology, where you see this kind of tortuous uh, ball of what look like kind of wormy vessels that are all kind of twisted on each other. And that's a, that's a vascular malformation where the blood vessels didn't form correctly, and they didn't form these nice long tubes like this. They're all interconnected. These can bleed. These can cause strokes. So these are not good to have, okay? Here's an example of calcification, which where we see calcium that gets deposited in the brain. And this is a condition called Sturge-Weber syndrome, where there's kind of a progressive shrinking or atrophy of parts of the brain. And when that happens, the brain uh, will develop these deposits of calcium, which we can pick up. 
Now, this picture was not taken with contrast like the other one was. There's no contrast here. This is the brain itself that lights up like that because of the calcium. And then this is an example of if someone uh, was not wearing their helmet and they were riding their bike and they hit the back of their head really hard, this piece of skull is not where it should be, right? Most of the time, because you're because in a fully developed skull, it's basically fuses together to form one bone. If you see a break at one side of the skull, you have to find the break at the other side too. You can't just have a single crack. Very rare to see that. So this is a displaced skull fracture where the skull is broken. And actually, if you were to put your hand along this, you might even feel a little dent in the head above this. So this is bad news bears, okay? Luckily, this person does not seem to have any bleeding because this is a CAT scan and CAT scans are good at finding bleeding. So we don't really see a lot of bleeding going on, okay? Uh, so that's CT. Uh, let me just pause for like three seconds and see if um, for some reason my chat window disappeared. Um, I didn't know if there were any questions specific to CT kind of while we're on uh, CT. I don't know what happened to my chat window, so I don't know if you've got anything. Questions yet. I think you're doing, you're explaining everything away. <laughs> <laughs> well, do what I can. All right, so onward. Um, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. So MRI is super cool. It's uh, something that we use all the time. Uh, it was invented back in kind of the 70s and 80s by three gentlemen. Um, uh, one of those gentlemen, two of those gentlemen got the Nobel Prize in medicine. One did not. He was very upset. If you read about it, it's a fascinating story. He took out a full page ad in the New York Times about it. Uh, but anyway, so MRI kind of revolutionized neuro neurology. Um, it it, it um, was developed at kind of towards the end of the Cold War. And the reason that's important is because actually the same technology we use in MRI uh, to take pictures of your brain is, um, is the same stuff we use in nuclear resonance imaging where we used to look at, we still use it to use it to look at chemicals in a solution, to try to figure out what sort of chemicals exist in some sort of a sample. They said at the end of the Cold War, where we were talking about nuclear warheads and all this stuff, they didn't want to put the word nuclear um, into the name of a scan because they thought nobody would want to do it because it sounds scary. Um, so they decided to call it magnetic resonance imaging and drop the nuclear off the beginning. Okay, um, MRIs are nice because they don't involve radiation. There's no x-rays, there's no radioactive isotopes. All they involve is a really big donut magnet like this, okay? And they involve these things called coils, which are literally coils of wire that are encased in really hard plastic. What they do is they use those coils of wire, they pass a lot of electricity through them to create an electric field from that coil. And then they use the magnetic field of the MRI to, uh, to tell you where you are in the body. And also they use that same magnetic field, th then they use that same metal coil that generates that electric field as an antenna to measure signals put off by your water molecules and to tell you what's going on in your body. And we'll get into a little more detail about that in a second, okay? Um, so there's no radiation. Uh, obviously it's a big magnet. So if you have a hunk of metal in you um, that uh, would go towards a magnet, you should not go in an MRI ever or even near an MRI for that matter. Some metals like certain types of titanium and whatnot are okay in an MRI, but you have to be absolutely sure about that because the magnetic field of an MRI is on the order of magnitude of that of the earth, right? So if you were to take, there's go on YouTube and look at like what happens when you put metal objects in an MRI and um, that will forever frighten you about if you have metal in you, why not to go in an MRI, okay? But uh, uh, certain devices like we have vagus nerve stimulators that are MRI compatible, those can go in an MRI. Uh, certain types of wires can go in there. You have to be careful the wires are not too long because longer wires can be bad in MRI. Um, but if you're ever not sure, talk to uh, your neurologist and ultimately the imaging people where you're going to get your MRI done to make sure you are MRI compatible. Um, a lot of things that get overlooked are like shrapnel. So if you may have shrapnel in you or metal filings or any small pieces of metal that may have been embedded in you at some point in your life, like you used to do a lot of woodworking or something, um, be very careful about going in an MRI if you've never been in one before. So most kids are MRI compatible unless they have certain types of implants and other things. Okay, MRI is great for measuring soft tissue like brain, uh, skin, fat, uh, tendons. Um, it's okay for imaging uh, uh, 
bone. It's pretty good for imaging blood and minerals, especially if you use IV contrast, which is called gadolinium for an MRI. Um, it's really good for imaging those blood vessels if you use that contrast. And um, it's really cool for imaging brain fibers, which really I think it's the only thing out there we have to actually measure bundles of brain fibers as they go. And I'll show you some cool pictures later, okay? So um, what can we pick up with an MRI? What sort of diseases do we look for? Honestly, just about everything. We can pick up bleeds, strokes, malformations, scar tissue, uh, blood vessel malformations, brain malformations, infections, tumors, uh, low blood flow, low oxygen levels, uh, malformed brain tissues, uh, many, many things can be picked up on MRI. Now, um, they can be picked up on MRI, but let's say you have a very, very, very small dysplastic brain tissue. Could an MRI miss it? Absolutely, right? Because if you have a, a t place, piece of tissue in your brain that's you know, less than a millimeter or so, um, the MRI may not pick it up because the, the smallest piece of brain tissue we can take a picture of is a one millimeter by one millimeter by one millimeter voxel or volumetric pixel, okay? So if you have a very small malformation, it might not be detected with an MRI. Similarly in kids, if you're a very small kid, like a newborn and we do an MRI, um, and your brain is mostly high water content, hasn't developed the fatty myelin coverings that we see later in life, you could easily miss even somewhat larger malformations because they won't look as striking as they would in a fully developed brain. So that's part of the question of when would I repeat imaging. In kids, we repeat MRIs all the time because as they grow, their brain gets bigger, their brain develops, becomes more fatty, the contrast between different areas of the brain becomes more striking, and we are able to detect things that we were unable to detect when we imaged them when they were younger. So if you have epilepsy, you're a kid, uh, you're still having trouble getting control with medications, we still don't know why you had epilepsy, we often will repeat that MRI to see if something is more apparent as your brain gets bigger and fattier over time, okay? How an MRI works. I'm not gonna get too into the weeds here, so don't be like overwhelmed by these little dots and arrows and everything. But basically it images water. Now, can you use an MRI to, to measure something besides water? Absolutely, but what is most of our body made of? Water, so we get the most signal from measuring water. You can measure things like sodium and potassium and other stuff, and that's been done. Uh, but to look at the brain, water is really our go-to, right? So water molecules have polarity to them, right? They're polar compounds. They have an oxygen, two hydrogens. And so they have these magnetic fields that are involved with them, and they kind of just spin around all willy-nilly if you don't do anything about it, right? But if we take you and we stick your water molecules in a big donut magnet, right, um, the water molecules either will align with the magnet or against the magnet. And it'll be about a 50-50 split, but a few, few of those water molecules will go one way more so than the other side. So there'll be a few that don't completely line up. We call those unmarked, uh, unmatched molecules or atoms in this case, right? So we put that big coil of metal that's encased in plastic above the area of your body we're interested in, and we pulse electrical activity through that coil, and it flips, it flips. Um, these unpaired um, or unmatched atoms in the opposite direction and aligns them in a different way, okay? And then we turn off the electricity of that coil and those molecules will flip back. And when they flip back from this high energy state to their normal low energy state, they will emit a signal. And that signal gets picked up by the same coil that emitted the original electric field as a signal and we use computers to decode that signal and figure out how much water we're talking about and where it is, okay? That's a very simplistic, that's like decades of research that's developed MRI covered in about 45 seconds, but, um, but that's how it works. So um, like I said, no irradiation, no, um, you know, no x-rays, nothing like that, just electricity, electric fields, magnetic fields, and that's about it, okay? Cool. So here's a few examples of what we can see on an MRI. Here's a type, here's one sequence in an MRI called a diffusion weighted imaging. And we can see here that an area of the brain that looks kind of like a wedge, right? Kind of comes to a point here and then kind of out, looks like it has abnormal diffusion, meaning the water's not moving normally in this area. 
that tells us that we're worried that this area has been injured and this would probably represent a stroke, okay? Strokes very commonly, but not always, will look like kind of a wedge like this and we call that a wedge-shaped infarct, okay? Here's an example of a more subtle finding. So you can kind of see, here's the brain, the gray matter is this darker stuff, the white matter is the lighter stuff. And you can see how nice and crisp this border is between the gray and white matter as it kind of travels and snakes its way down here and over here. Now, we have the help of a white arrow to point us at what's going on, but you can see right here, see how it gets all blurry and kind of fuzzy? And it's not as, if I told you, put your mouse on the border, you'd be like, well, kind of here, maybe here, as opposed to here, you'd be like, oh yeah, I can trace that with my finger, no problem. So this blurring of the border between the gray and white matter suggests to us that there's something that didn't form correctly here when this kid was a baby, right? Um, and this could be a focal cortical dysplasia. Focal meaning a small area or a focal single area. Cortical meaning it's next to the cortex or that gray matter um, outermost layer of the brain. And then dysplasia meaning abnormally formed tissue, okay? So this, this is probably a focal cortical dysplasia, which is a very common cause of focal seizures in children, okay? This is the same patient, different type of sequence, and you can see that the way the water is imaging here is very different than in any other part on both sides of this brain. So this one stands out a little more obvious, right? This is pretty subtle. You'd have to kind of know what you're doing. This, if I showed this to anybody, they'd be like, oh yeah, something's up over here, right? So we use these different sequences because they each pick out different things. Similarly, if I took a picture of this brain that has a stroke most likely, and, it, and the stroke had only happened a few hours ago, and I used this type of sequence, you probably wouldn't see anything. Whereas if I showed you this particular sequence here, you'd be like, oh yeah, something's up over here, obviously, right? So yeah, we have about a half dozen to a dozen different sequences we do depending on the reason. And this brings me to my point of why MRI should be done at centers where they have level four epilepsy groups, right? Because all level four epilepsy centers have to have a neuroimaging specialist at them. And also they all have uh, epilepsy protocol MRIs, which involve a very, very specific sequence, sequences that will really increase your odds of finding things like cortical dysplasias or, um, or uh, gliosis or scarring of the brain tissue, which are things that will often cause epilepsy, okay? So if, um, if you kind of go to random community imaging center that's not even connected to a hospital and they do an MRI, chances are it will not include the same high resolution pictures you would get at a, at a place that, that's, that has an epilepsy protocol. And chances are the person looking at that MRI probably does not have extra training in maybe even neuroimaging. So they may not even be a brain imaging specialist. They may just be like a whole body radiologist imaging specialist. Um, and if they do have a, a neuroimaging specialist and you're imaging a kid's brain, you really want a, somebody who has expertise in looking at pediatric brain images. So a pediatric neuroradiologist, right? Which are almost universally non-existent in community-based imaging centers, except for a few that I'm aware of, okay? So um, if your insurance will not allow you to get your MRIs done at a center that will do a really, really good job um, recording and interpreting the MRI, um, you can get the copy of your MRI on a CD and bring it to your neurologist, and then your neurologist is able to look at it and render the best opinion they can. But keep in mind the whole garbage in, garbage out philosophy. If a non-epilepsy protocol MRI was done on your kid and you bring it to an, even an epilepsy specialist, if the images aren't there, we can't see it. You know what I'm saying? So if there's a very small cortical dysplasia that would only be picked up by one millimeter slices in the coronal plane of your MRI and those weren't done, we're gonna look at the MRI and say, well, we don't see anything, but we can't re reassure you that there's nothing there because these three sequences weren't done, which really should have been done. So um, if, if, if you have seizures and you're referred to get an MRI, please, please, please let your neurologist know if the MRI has been, if you've been told by your insurance, the MRI is supposed to be done at some random imaging center that's um, not affiliated with an epilepsy center, okay? It's really important, because otherwise then you gotta go through another MRI. And when you're talking about like a three-year-old who's gonna need anesthesia for an MRI, repeating that MRI again with anesthesia for a second time is an extra risk to your kid that really is un unnecessary. So we go to bat to insurance all the times and try to educate them about this. And honestly, it's usually a contracting thing. And once they hear the reasoning, they're like, oh yeah, sure, no, whatever, let's do it. So.
okay? Here's some other things. These are larger scale malformations. So you can see this brain is not really wrinkly. Okay, this is called lysencephaly or smooth brain. And on both sides, you can see that the wrinkles never developed in this child's brain. This is a, a condition we see all the time in epilepsy that causes um, seizures. Um, here uh, is a, uh, somewhere between this and a normal brain. And this is what we call a semi-lobar holoprosencephaly. So it's another larger malformation, but you can see there's kind of a few wrinkles here, but still much smoother brain than we would typically see in a kid this age. And then this is a little more subtle, but important. This is what we call mesial temporal sclerosis. So this is the temporal lobe. Mesial means towards the middle of the head. Um, and sclerosis means scar tissue. So you can see how there's a little bit of a brighter appearance to this hippocampus or part of the temporal lobe than this one. And you can see it even more so here. And you can see maybe there's a little more fluid here in the lateral ventricle, meaning maybe there's a little bit of shrink shrinkage to this area of the temporal lobe. So that would suggest to us that there's just maybe been some scarring in this area of the brain. And we know that this mesial temporal lobe here is a hot spot for generating seizures. If you tick this part of your brain off, it will be quick to generate seizures. So in our kids that we see febrile seizures, where they have a really long febrile seizure, like 15 minutes, 30 minutes or longer, a lot of times this area of the brain can be sensitive to that and can, can get some scar tissue. And then later in the life, they develop temporal lobe epilepsy. So this is why it's important to kind of get really good quality imaging done, okay? And then this is if you were to inject that IV contrast, which again is called gadolinium in the MRI as opposed to iodine in, um, in uh, you know, the CT scans, we can do what's called an arteriogram where we inject it in your veins, your blood pumps it up into your brain, and then we take pictures of it. This is a picture of the, the arteries in your brain. This is a picture of the ones going up from the top of your chest into your neck and up into, up into your brain, right? And we can use this to look for things like, for instance, look at this. Wow, that's a big aneurysm sitting there in the brain. That would be very bad if that popped, right? Um, so we can look for things like areas of the uh, different blood vessels that are not formed correctly, like those arterial vascular malformations that we looked at earlier. We can also look for aneurysms. We can look for um, area, blood vessels that have been blocked off. Like if you think we think you had a stroke, we can see does that blood vessel not show any blood flow anymore? You know, large vessel strokes too. So this is a very helpful test too. We don't usually do the arteriogram all the time in our epilepsy patients unless we have a specific concern for a blood vessel problem. So sometimes you'll get your regular MRI, right? And we go, oh boy, look, there's a stroke. And hopefully, if, we can do this while you're in the scanner and say, look, it's a stroke. Let's do an arteriogram while we're in there. Otherwise, we may need to do an arteriogram as a secondary scan later to make sure that you're not at risk for having more strokes, for instance, okay? Uh, and then something super cool, look at how colorful that is, right? So this is called tractography. We can measure, um, when we measure water, we can also measure how easily it can move in different directions. And when we measure a small voxel or volumetric area of water, and um, we notice it can only move in one direction. That tells us it's within a fiber of, of nerve tissue, like a nerve fiber that's running in a specific direction. We can use that to define different nerve pathways and fiber pathways that travel from one area to the brain to the other. We use this at chalk with our surgery planning where we say, okay, uh, I'm gonna look at the, the part of the brain where the, where the, um, the hand, mo hand movement is, is resides, right? So you do a functional MRI, you can look at where the, um, wh where the different functional movements of the hand reside in the brain. And then you can draw all the tracks that come down from that motor cortex into the deeper structures of the brain and ultimately into the spinal cord. Because when you go in to do surgery, you don't wanna mess with any of that because you don't want the kid to get a weak hand, right? So tractography is very helpful to identify what areas to avoid during surgery. And also it can also, if tracks are disrupted by something like an infection or a tumor or a dysplasia, you can sometimes see that too, okay? And then a couple more types of scans. So this is a PET scan, so a positron emission tomography scan. This also uses radiation, but not in the way an X-ray does. This is a scan where you're injected with um, these special sugar molecules that are connected to tiny radioactive molecules that kind of get pumped throughout your body, okay? since it's sugar and the brain loves sugar, the brain will try to absorb these molecules and use them for energy. Um, 
So it will take the molecules out of your blood, take it up into your brain cells, and then they will stay there. Now, the amount of sugar your brain cell tries to take in depends on how active it is. If it's doing a lot of work, it gets really hungry, right? And it's going to try to pull in as much sugar as it can. If it's a dysfunctional part of the brain, like something where we think there's some scarring or we think epilepsy might or some seizures might be coming from, when that part of the brain is not actually seizing, it does not use as much sugar because it's not functional normally, okay? So this example here, you can see this brighter color is more normal activity where this is all taking up a lot of sugar. It's using it. It all looks really nice and normal. And you see it's all about the same color, more or less true. You start looking on the other side, you're like, okay, well, this looks about right. This is fine. And then you get to here and you're like, whoa, something's kind of missing here. Look at how bright this is. And this is dark. This part of the brain might not be you know, functioning as well or not using as much sugar. So this would raise your suspicion that seizures may be coming from this part of the brain. Similarly, you look up here in the frontal lobe and you go, whoa, look up here too. This whole nice bright area of cortex we see over here, when we look at it over here, it all goes dark. So this temporal lobe and frontal lobe here look a lot darker than the other side do. And these would raise your suspicion that maybe the epilepsy in this patient is coming from either the frontal, the temporal lobe, or both, okay? I threw in another thing here. Think of this as your like bonus for the day. It wasn't in the title, wasn't in the advertisement, but because you're here, you get to see it. Um, this is a spec scan. This is something that uh, is done at certain uh, epilepsy centers. And this is where uh, basically somebody is at the bedside or watching the EEG when the kids, uh, the kids admitted that they put a continuous EEG monitoring on. Somebody watches the EEG. And as soon as they see a seizure start, they inject this substance into the in, into the blood. Um, it's this technetium-99. It's a radioactive tracer. And what we know is that this substance gets take up, taken up just like the PET scan by very active uh, parts of the brain based on blood flow, okay? So if your brain starts seizing, whatever part of the brain the seizure is coming from will, 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 um, will change so that more blood flow goes to that part of your brain, okay? So this tracer, while you, so once you start seizing, they inject this tracer into your vein, gets pumped up into your brain, and then your brain will take it up um, during the seizure in the area this, that are most active in terms of blood flow. So here's the picture of what it looks like when you inject it during a seizure. See, it's kind of bright over here, but you're, you look at it and you're like, well, it's kind of bright over here. It's not quite as bright. Is this real? Who knows, right? So then what you do, so this is picture number one. You take this, what we call ictal spec scan, which is where you see increased blood flow in the area where the seizure started. Then you take a second picture. So some other time when the kid is not having a seizure, you do it all again. You inject the same tracer, you inject it the same way, and you take the same pictures. And you get this picture, which we call interictal. Now, if you just looked at this interictal scan, you'd say, okay, the right and the left, they look pretty much the same. It doesn't really tell me much. But then the power of the spec scan comes what we call subtraction spec, where we take this baseline scan and we subtract it from this ictal scan and we see what we're left with, right? When we do that, we say, wow, look at this hot spot here. Look at how much brighter this is here than it was here. That makes us really suspicious that this is where that seizure came from. And that can help us plan surgeries or other interventions like laser ablations in patients where we think we know where the seizures are coming from, but we don't have an exact target. The spec scan is a, is a non-invasive way to help us figure that out. Okay, or if we're thinking of doing phase two monitoring where we're sticking electrodes into or onto an area, this would tell us you better cover this area because there's a good chance that's where the seizure starts. Okay. Lastly, I'll talk a little bit briefly about a MEG scan. MEG scan is magnetoencephalography. Okay. So the MEG scan is more like a horizontal donut than a vertical donut. It's a much smaller donut and you're not really inside of it. It just kind of covers, you know, the top half of your head. Okay, um, the MEG scan is really cool. It's like one of my favorite things because it's so engineering and technical. I love it. So it measures both EEG activity, like when you have the electrodes on measuring your electrical activity, and it measures tiny perturbations in the magnetic fields inside your brain. Like how cool is that, right? So um, if you think back to your physics that you may have taken at some point in your life, anytime uh, electricity travels, it generates a magnetic field. And every time you have a magnetic field, it generates an electric field. So the two of these things interact. And so when you see a spike or an abnormal waveform on an EEG, 
Um, this machine measures how the magnetic field of the brain fluctuates with that. And what's really cool about that is, is this machine can measure those magnetic fields and then using some pretty awesome math, estimate where in the brain that little, that little spike came from, right? When we're just measuring with EEG on the scalp, um, we can back calculate where we think something on the scalp came from, but it's not always as incredibly um, accurate as we wish it could be because we're limited by how many of those stickers that we put on a kid's head, which is usually 19 or 21 stickers, right? This machine can measure 64, like, like imagine you had 64 stickers on your head. This machine can measure high resolution and get a much better mathematical calculation of where this stuff came from, okay? Also, when you measure these magnetic field um, perturbations, sometimes you can see a third of the time if there's a spike there um, that, uh, if you look at all the spikes that a brain makes when, when somebody has um, seizures, a third of people will have some spikes that can only be picked up by MEG that are completely invisible to EEG. So the MEG scan is a really nice tool when you have your EEG, you have your MRI, you don't really have a good target on your MRI or a good lesion to know where these things are coming from. You have an idea from your EEG and, or you don't see any spikes on an EEG and you're like, I just wonder if there's some other spikes I'm missing here. That's when you go to your MEG scan to try to help you figure out where the seizures come from, okay? So here's kind of, so you look at all these cool sensors. This is like the whole brain here. Here's all the tiny waves. And you can see, see these spikes here? Spike, 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 spike. You can kind of see in your eyes this little field of these spikes. And the machine takes that. It can generate what's called a dipole, which is like it looks at the positive and the negative end of the spike and models where it is. And then it says, look, it's right here right here in your head, that's where that spike came from, which I think is pretty much the coolest thing ever, okay? Um, what you do with that then is you measure a ton of spikes and you see if they all come from the same place. So like, let's say you're like, wow, look, I captured a hundred spikes and they're all right here. That would make your suspicion that this part of the brain is irritated for some reason or generates seizures very high and would really make you think about whether epilepsy surgery is a good idea or even phase two monitoring and really covering this area well to make sure that if there are seizures coming from there, you capture them, right? On the other hand, sometimes you do it and you're like, wow, those spikes are coming from both sides of the brain. Maybe this is somebody I shouldn't go in and take out their temporal lobe because look at that other temporal lobe, it looks just as gnarly, right? So it really helps you to fine tune your prognostication or your best guess of how a patient's going to do after surgery um, especially if you don't have a specific lesion on the MRI, okay? Then what they do is they take all these spikes and they can use a model of, of your patient, of your kid's brain to say, okay, all the spikes put together, boom, this is where we think the seizures are coming from. And now we're gonna do phase two monitoring with some electrodes inside or on the brain to really map this area out, make sure there's no specific function there that's really important, figure out where the seizure starts, how it spreads, and then plan a surgery to remove that seizure onset zone to hopefully help your kid be seizure free. So very cool technology. Um, a couple ups and downs of it though. Number one, the uh, important things to know is this absolutely needs to be done at a center with a lot of expertise, right? So, and, and, and luckily enough, most centers that actually have a MEG scanner have a good bit of expertise because point number two, MEG scanners are expensive. Um, a lot of insurances don't think it's worthwhile to pay for them. So write to your congressman and tell them, like for instance, like CCS, Medi-Cal, et cetera, it can be very hard to get them to pay for these scans. Whereas like PPOs and other things will pay for them, which is a huge disparity. And so, um, and, but, but, but it's a big deterrent to centers for bringing these sorts of scanners to their centers because this is a multi-million dollar scanner. It costs, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to run, right? And if insurance isn't gonna to pay to do the scan, you know, then you're just gonna start hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging money as soon as you get this thing set up, unless you have a huge research component and research studies that can also help to fund the scanner and use the scanner time, et cetera. So at Chalk, for instance, we don't have a MEG scanner. Um, there's a MEG scanner down in UC San Diego. There's also one up at UCSF. And we send a lot of our, we have a really good relationship with the folks that run the scanner at UCSF. Uh, we send a lot of patients up there uh, to get the MEG scans. And then we talk with those. Uh, those scans are interpreted by a, an epilepsy expert up there, um, Heidi Kirsch, who's fantastic. Uh, every time I send a kid up there, I, she and I talk on the phone. We pull up the pictures. We go over it together. It's like having a whole other set of eyes on my kid's case. 
So um, it's a very powerful technology if you know how to use it and you work with people who do a really good job with it, okay? So um, this is kind of a little brief overview at the end here, when to get scanned. So like we said, CTs are good when you have bleeding, skull fractures, um, calcifications, et cetera. So if you come in and all of a sudden you're like a normal kid and then you had this, this very unusual event that was like, boom, you know, the kid's not acting normal, we can't wake them up, et cetera. They'll often do a CT scan to rule out these big bad things, right? Head trauma, bleeding, those sorts of stuff. Um, MRIs, almost, uh, almost every kid who has epilepsy uh, will get an MRI done unless they have a classic epilepsy syndrome and they're a classic presentation of it. And it's a syndrome that's known to result uh, from an, a, 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 the syndrome that's known to have universally normal MRI findings. So for instance, if you come in and you have classic uh, benign childhood epilepsy with central temporal spikes like Rolandic epilepsy, uh, you, it's like you wrote the book on the thing, you're a normal kid, you're cognitively normal, um, your seizures are under control on one medication, we, we probably won't MRI you, right? Because, because it's not gonna change what we do, right? If on the other hand, you come in We've already tried three medications. Uh, we don't know why you're having seizures. It doesn't look like a known syndrome. It's more of a focal epilepsy. We would absolutely MRI you. Um, and it, it's just kind of a case-by-case -case difference. And it's a little bit dependent on the way the different uh, specialist practices, okay? PETs, MEGs, and SPEC scans, they're typically reserved for people that we think about surgery for. Um, so, and those are usually our kids that either have a known. Uh, so if we do an MRI scan and we see something, that's like, for instance, like a tumor or um, a bleed or a malformation and we're going to do surgery, sometimes we'll employ these scans pretty early. Often it's once you've failed more than two seizure medications, we talk about doing these to help determine whether you're a good candidate for surgery. And surgery doesn't just mean going in and taking out a piece of your brain. It can also mean using a laser to uh, ablate an area of tissue where we think you maybe have a malformation. It could be cutting the connections between different parts of your brain to try to limit the spread of seizures, many different things. And these scans are really helpful for us to figure out where seizures are starting, how they spread, and how much of your brain's involved to help plan those sorts of procedures, okay? And how we used to, what do we do as epilepsy specialists with these scans? Well, a lot of these, like I've talked a lot about kind of epilepsy surgery more or less in this talk, but we use it for a lot more than that. So uh, we have certain medications that work really well depending on the type of seizures you have, right? So if, if you have focal epilepsy, different sets of medications will work well for you than if you have generalized epilepsy, meaning your whole brain kind of fires off at once. Um, if you have temporal lobe epilepsy, there's certain medications that work better for that than others. If you have frontal lobe epilepsy, there's certain medications that are not so great for frontal lobe epilepsy. So um, we use this learning, learning about where your seizures come from, or maybe if they're multifocal or not, to help us determine which medicines would be the best idea for you. Obviously, we can help predict how you do, right? So if we do a brain scan and you have lysencephaly and your whole brain looks like that really smooth brain picture earlier, that helps us to predict how you're going to do, both from a seizure standpoint and also from a learning and cognition standpoint, right? Um, it also helps us to diagnose why you have seizures, which is really helpful because maybe if we see that you have a malformation of the brain, maybe we don't need to do a ton of genetic testing, which might be very expensive, right? Maybe we do, because sometimes when we see malformations, it may have a genetic cause. Um, it also helps us to plan for whether we need to do more monitoring with phase two monitoring, which is where we will put electrodes onto or into the brain to capture seizures. And those are, that's usually done when we're thinking about doing surgery. And also maybe it helps us plan in terms of surgical interventions too. Um, not just removal of tissue, but also, uh, you know, lasering of uh, areas of the uh, areas of the brain, brain that may be generating seizures. I didn't put it down here, but also we have devices we can implant into the brain to help control seizures. And these sorts of techniques can help us figure out where to put those. Um, so it's very helpful for some of these decision-making processes, okay? So that's all I've got. Um, I, I intentionally left, uh, a, a, wow, a little bit of time. I thought it was gonna be more than that. We have six minutes. <laughs> Um, and I tried to cover a lot in a very short amount of time and tried to be as um, detailed as I can without getting too deep into the weeds here. So um, any, uh, maybe I'll stop this so I can pull up the... Um, yeah, I'm not seeing questions. I think you were so detailed that I think 
if anybody has questions, please utilize that chat section in the next few minutes here so that we can get those answer those uh, questions answered. I know that I've learned a lot from this and I had a lot of things that I had a general understanding that I had questions I didn't even know I had answered. So I really appreciate it. Um, sure. If anybody else has anything to add, any imaging questions, any, you know, Dr. Shry is an epileptologist, any questions um, to, to ask him? If not, I will start just wrapping up then, I guess. Um, so it, it looks like one person is trying to connect to audio. I don't know oh, if they're okay, trying to yes, ask a question. Can. Yes, it looks like we have someone could call. I'm trying to check connecting to audio. So if you have a question you want to ask via audio, maybe you don't have access to your chat. No? All right. Okay. okay well, thanks so much for, uh, for having me. I hope, I hope this was uh, informative and um, and obviously there's a lot more to imaging than what you can fit in about 55 minutes. Um, but, uh, I really encourage you, you know, if you have imaging and especially if it's, if it's not normal imaging to sit down, look at the pictures with, uh, your neurologist, um, go through them in detail to answer all your questions. Cause I think, uh, at least from the parents of the patients I take care of, they've told me a lot about how helpful it is to them to understand, um, what the process is to actually see the pictures. You know, because I can sit here and, you know, eloquently wax about what a cortical dysplasia is, but if they don't see it, you know, a uh, picture of what it looks like, they may have a hard time understanding the size of it. Um, similarly, a lot of our kids that have brain malformations, it's hard to understand what does a normal brain look like? What does the malformation look like? Unless you look at these sorts of pictures. So, um, so I encourage you to talk with your uh, neurologist about that, learn some more about it. Yeah, excellent. And I, I love, Dr. Shry, how you went into the difference between an epilepsy center and what that can really do for diagnostic and treatment. Um, something that we do, I'm, again, if you joined before my introduction, I'm from Epilepsy Support Network of Orange County and Sophie's Journey, the presenting um, organization, asks us to help out. We actually, my organization, ESNOC, we do help get people from their neurologists to those these excellent doctors, especially here in Orange County. We're pretty well versed in it. But if you have any questions on, on if you know, you're stuck in a spot and you need that expert care, um, we help get you there. So give our um, organization a call or check out our website. I have our information down there in the um, chat section too, because we want you to see these, these excellent doctors like Dr. Shry. I had, I had one last thing to leave you with. Um, if you ever have imaging done of your brain, get a copy of it on a CD. Um, because the report that comes um, is not too helpful most of the time. Uh, the actual ability to pull up the images, look at them, copy them into our computer system is invaluable. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had um, uh, somebody come bring a CD with a report that says completely normal and, and then I pulled it up and found a dysplasia or some other focus that completely explains, you know, their kid's seizures and they haven't known for years why the kid has seizures and I just look at the MRI and see it. So get it on a CD, never give away your CD, make a copy for anybody who wants it, but never give away the CD because um, it, we all know things can just disappear into the ether um, and never come back. Uh, so just give a copy and, um, and then, you know, always have that, especially if you're going to see a new neurologist, you're going to move, get all of those images on the disc um, and keep them with you. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Shrey. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a wonderful Thank day. Bye. Bye. Take care.